I know last week I talked about funerals, um, and I kind of skipped over weddings, but I actually really do really, really, really enjoy weddings, okay? I don't want you guys to just hear what I said last week and go, oh, he likes funerals, but doesn't enjoy weddings too. I love weddings. Um, I love weddings a lot. I love preparing for weddings. Um, I like doing, you know, premarital counseling and seeing couples kind of start to date and walk through their relationship with them. And then being able to officiate a wedding is, is one of the biggest honors because it's, I mean, it's like the biggest day of your life where all the people you know will be there, um, probably not again till your funeral. And so it's, it's a big, big, big day. Um, and, and I reminded Parker and Ashley when I was doing their funeral or their wedding, sorry, not their funeral, uh, hopefully that won't be for a long, maybe somebody else can do that one. Um, they're much younger than I am. So, um, but yeah, as I, as I was doing their wedding, you know, I, I know in Christian circles, we talk a lot about like, oh, it's not about the wedding, it's about the marriage. And I'm like, yeah, I get the sentiment of that. But the Bible did open with the wedding and end with the wedding, right? I mean, it's important. And Jesus started his ministry in John at a wedding. And so weddings clearly are, are a, a big thing because they're pointing to something that we will get when Christ returns. I mean, this is the passage when Jesus shows up and, and he, he comes and he saves his bride, right? We, we talked about this back in, in Genesis is that, you know, it's a, it's a really good hero story. The whole Bible is about a, a warrior or a conqueror that's coming to slay the dragon and save his bride. And that's exactly what Jesus does here. I mean, so every wedding, my wedding, your wedding, any wedding you attend, it's all pointing towards this greatest, the best wedding of all time. And as, as Josh read the story about it, as we sang about it in our songs, I wonder when you think about that day, if that's something that you're like, yes, come Lord Jesus, come quickly. Or if you're like, I don't know about all this, right? I don't, I don't know if there will be a wedding. I don't know which, if I'll be able to go because I feel unworthy or I feel like I, I can't really be sure that I'll be there. And so as we look at our text today, what I, what I want us to think through as, as we look at this is, is how do we get to be at this wedding? And if we are going to be at the wedding, how do we prepare ourselves for this wedding? Let's look first at verse 6 to 10. Um, this is kind of the first big section. So it's kind of divided up. I mean, we've seen this throughout Revelation, right? When, when John says, like, then I heard or then I saw, those are really big kind of movements of, like, this is a unit, right? And so we see, then I heard in verse 6, and then, when I, then I saw in verse 11 and, and 17. So that's kind of my, I'm going to break the sermon up. So let's look at verse 6 to 10, where he, he hears of the, what seems like a great multitude, and then he starts describing this bride, and if you think about the last time we, we heard of a woman, in a good sense, in Revelation, not the prostitute from the last couple of chapters, but you go all the way back to chapter 12. And the woman, which represented the people of God, was kind of left in the wilderness. Satan is on her heels trying to attack the people of God. And God protects her and nourishes her as she waits to be brought into the promised land. And so as, as that kind of left us with a cliffhanger a number of chapters ago, like, this is the hope of chapter 12, where chapter 12 leaves off. This is the hope. I mean, we see this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful picture of this bride. It's so different <clears throat> than the prostitute that we've been reading about the last couple weeks. So different. So let me read verse 6 to 10 again, just so we guys, we can try to just picture this, okay? John says, Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters. The people, so loud, it sounds like waters are roaring all in around. The, the sound of, of mighty peals of thunder. And what are they crying out? Hallelujah. For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give Him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His bride has made herself ready. And it was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, and the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And then the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then he said, these are the true words of God. And I fell down at his feet and worshiped him, but he said to me, you must not do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy." I mean, as we read that, think about 
where we've been in Revelation, even if we just think about us here now as a church body, Grace Hewitt, I mean, you see this transformation from an impure church to a beautiful, perfect bride with the best, most pure wedding dress on, right? I mean, we go from a persecuted church to, we'll get there later in verse 14, but we're also a triumphant army in our wedding dress. It's probably a a really fascinating picture to think through, but I, I want you to think just a little bit about what this wedding is communicating and why God uses the imagery of weddings to communicate to us what's going to happen when Christ comes back. This is what one historian said. He said, in biblical times, a marriage involved two events, the betrothal, or we call it engagement, um, but betrothal is a little bit more of a commitment. So the betrothal and the wedding, those are the two major events in a marriage. These were normally separated by a period of time by which the two individuals were considered husband and wife, and as such were under the obligations of faithfulness. That's the betrothal. Then the wedding began with a procession to the bride's house, which was followed by a return to the house of the groom for the marriage feast. And so by analogy then here, the church espoused to Christ, betrothed to Christ by faith, now awaits his second coming when our heavenly groom will come back for his bride and return to his home, heaven, for the marriage feast that lasts throughout all eternity. Throughout all eternity. I mean, we've, we've seen this before. If you've read through the Gospels, in, in John 14, Jesus says, I am going to prepare a place for you, and I'm going to bring you there. I mean, I came once to betroth you guys, and I'm coming again to bring you home. And, and we need to understand, like, I'll, I'll flesh this out a little bit more as we get into it, but understand that betrothal is a lot deeper than just the, the engagement. We get down on a knee and ask a question. Like, Jesus didn't just come and get down on a knee, right? He, he got on a cross and shed his blood. He didn't just propose to us. He purchased us, and he sealed us with the Holy Spirit for eternity. And so what we see then in these verses, is that when Christ returns, he will come back and serve a feast to his bride. So if you're taking notes, it's kind of the, the if you want to make this the, the point for verse 6 to, to 10, is that Christ will serve a feast to his bride. He will serve a feast to his bride. And so we go, okay, well, if we're the bride, which is the church, great. How do I get myself ready? Because verse Eight says, or verse 7 says that the bride has made herself ready. You're like, okay, great. How do we make ourselves ready? Again, think about the marriage analogy here, right? We should commit to him. We should commit to him. When he comes and, and he, he offers us salvation, we should say, yes, I, I, I want that. I want to receive that. I, I want to be in relationship with you. I want to enter this covenant with you. And that's where, in verse 9, when the angel said, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. These are the true words of God. Like, this is your offer. There is an open invitation, just as we read in the parable earlier. There is an open invitation to this feast. And so betroth yourself. Say yes to Jesus. Enter a covenant with Him by faith. Like, just come and say, "I, I want to be there, but there's nothing on my own that can actually get me there. And so the only way I can get there is if my dirty, filthy clothes, which represent our deeds, right, if they've been washed by the blood of Jesus and made pure and white. And so then, then we get to go to the feast. And as we think all the way back to the first couple chapters of the book of Revelation, when, when letters were sent out to all the churches, I mean, think about the, the promises to the church, to those who conquer, to those who endure, to those who believe in Christ and hold on to that faith all the way to the end. I mean, in chapter 2, it says we get to eat from the tree of life in paradise. To anyone who conquers. We conquer how? By the blood of the Lamb and the words of our testimony. So we believe in Christ and we get to eat from the tree of life. And even in chapter 3, Jesus says, I'm standing at the door knocking. If you just open it, I'm going to come in. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to dine with you. I'm going to dine with you. But what's wild about this marriage supper is that we, church, we, brothers and sisters, we're not just guests. Like, we're the bride. We're the bride. 
I mean, like when Jesus promises in chapter 2 to give us a new name, it's his name, just like in a marriage, right? The wife, yeah, we, we, the wife takes the name of the husband. So we, we take the name of Jesus. And then in chapter 3, he says, I'm going to clothe you in white garments. And so this isn't just great because, oh, this is a fun wedding we get to attend that will be awesome, and I'm sure the food there is going to be amazing, literally, out of this world. I'm sure it's going to be great. But we're actually the bride here. And if any of you guys have been married before, like the reason I love my wedding more than any other wedding I've done, which I love all of the weddings, you know, and if you ask me about our wedding, I mean, the DJ like mixed up the don't playlist and make sure you playlist. Um, you know, it, it rained, so we were inside. I mean, all the things went wrong, but why I love that day more than anything in the world is because my bride was there. My bride was there because that's what it's all about. So when Jesus is saying, this is what's going to be for you, church, you're going to be there, and we're going to feast and celebrate, and it's going to be the greatest day of our eternity. It's going to be the best. All right, so the first thing, right, commit yourself to him. Believe in him. Second is get, get your dress. Get, get ready for the wedding. How do we get ready for the wedding? Well, we go pick out a dress, right? I, I told Michelle I wouldn't say it, but I think she's in with the kids, but say yes to the dress, right? Go get the dress, which if you look down in verse 8, there's this really fascinating thing. It's like, okay, who, who got the dress? Who's, whose responsibility is this dress? Because it says at the beginning of verse 8, it was granted to her to clothe herself. But then it says, at the end of verse 8, it says, the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. So you're like, wait, did, did the, was it given to us or is it something we do? Like what, what's being communicated here? And this is the, the idea, right, that, that salvation is a gift. It is in Christ alone. Only he can give us what we need. Only he can give us right standing before God. It's by nothing we do. It's only by faith in him, not by works, right? And that's, that's the, the righteousness that we need to stand before God with. And so we're made white by the blood of the lamb. But then it also says the righteous deeds. And, and what happens is when God saves us and, and justifies us, we're going to kind of get into some soteriology here. So just hang with me, all right? When we are justified by faith, we're, we're given a new heart, right? We're made alive in Christ. He takes our, our dead, cold heart of stone and gives us a heart of flesh. And, and we believe in him and we love him. And then with this new heart, now we can do the things that we couldn't do before. We can please God. We now can obey his commands. We now can commune with him. We now can experience him. We now can talk to him and and walk with him and spend time with him, enjoy him and delight in him. We can now do these things. And yet it is us doing, but it's God through us, right? I mean, Paul talks about this a lot in all of his letters. He says, um, He said, I worked harder than any of them, yet it wasn't I, but Christ through me. And he even says to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it's God to will and to work in you for his good pleasure. And so it's this, I now, by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the new heart and the righteousness that's been given to me by Christ, I do want to please the Lord. Now, I know for some of you, maybe who were raised in like a legalistic background, this is... probably on really thin ice here, right? Because you're like, wait a minute, Michael. It's not about the things we do. I'm like, yeah, for sure. It's not at all. But it's, it's not legalistic to want to please the person that you love, right? It's not legalistic. If, if you come home from work and you clean the house because that's what your spouse would like, you're not trying to earn your spouse's love. You're saying, hey, I love you, and I know this would mean a lot to you, and I know you love this, so I want to do this. Yeah, it's not fun, but I want to do this because I love you, and I care for you. I mean, if, you, if, if your wife likes flowers, then get her flowers because she likes flowers. If she doesn't like flowers, chocolates, or maybe build something. Whatever it is, like, you know these things that your spouse loves, and so then out of a heart of love, that's what then motivates us to then, well, do what is right and do what is pleasing to the Lord, And so if we think about that in in the context of our righteous deeds here in verse 8, our righteous deeds are what come from the heart, 
right? It's, it's not about, oh, I went to church, I prayed, I, I, I didn't swear today, I didn't yell at anyone, you know, I, I gave a homeless guy some, some money, I filled up his gas. It's, it's not about the deeds, because, I mean, we all know very moral atheists who, if you ask them deep down, I mean, I asked a friend of mine once a couple years ago, I said, why, do you, why are you so generous? Why do you give so much to other people? And he just said, it makes me feel amazing. And so I'm like, okay, well, you're not doing it unto the Lord, you're doing it unto yourself. You're doing it unto yourself, not unto the Lord. And so if we have good acts that are for ourselves, that's not righteous, right? That's self-serving. That's where we are our own God. But yet if we love someone, we, we want to do what pleases them with no strings attached. We're not trying to do chores around the house so then maybe later we can ask for something or, or get something or earn something or pay it back. That's not how covenant relationships work at all. And so if we know what God loves, which he explains in his word, if we know what he loves, he loves righteousness. He loves when we reflect him. And so we need to go, okay, God, help me love, like with my new heart, help me love what you love. Help me love patience, not a quick temper. Help me love generosity and not be greedy. Help me love pursuing you in in purity and not just letting my eyes and my mind wander because it feels good right now. And we need to think about the things that he loves and go, I want to love those things and I want to walk in them. I want to do what he loves. Remember, this is, it, it's a relationship, right? This is not just follow these rules because then that's like a contractual obligation, right? It's, well, you do this and then I'll get this. And that's just how the exchange works. But no, this is a relationship. He just, he wants to be in relationship with you. That's why he gives us this picture of the marriage supper. All right, so commit to him, get your dress, and the third thing that I would say is, is rehearse. Rehearse. Now, if, if you've ever been married before, or you've gotten ready for a wedding, or maybe you planned weddings before, your friends have gotten married before, there are parts of the wedding celebration that you actually have to prepare for, right? I mean, you have to, I mean, I'm not a great dancer, so Michelle and I had to practice dancing before we went and danced in front of 100 people as they just stared at us through their iPhones. It was terrifying, right? But, but we had to practice, all right? We had to go to the venue and taste the food that, oh, this is what's going to be served. Yes, serve that, not that, right? So we had food tastings. We had dance rehearsals in our living room. Like, we just, we did things that prepared ourselves and got ready as we got excited and we started counting down the days, longing for, I just can't wait for that day. And every day that got closer, we were like, I just can't wait, I can't wait, I can't wait. And that's honestly what we are to do here. Because if you think about what the angel says to him, after John falls at his feet to worship him, he says, don't do that. Don't worship me, you need to worship God. I mean, that's the one command in this whole section right here, is worship God. And when we worship God, when we gather together as a church body, I mean, this is what we're doing this morning literally is a dress rehearsal for what heaven will be like. When we come to the table and and take communion, that is pointing forward to the marriage supper feast. And when we sing and when we hear, like we read the word, but we get to be in the presence of the word of God, Jesus, forever. I mean, it's all pointing forward to that. It's all pointing forward to that. So we should gather with believers faithfully and regularly and worship the Lord and, and enjoy ourselves. But even as we like sit, even throughout the week, we should have people in our homes at our table being like, yeah, this, what we're doing right now, this is what we get to do forever. Where it's brothers and sisters dwelling in the unity that they have in Christ, enjoying God's good blessings of food or whatever it is, sports, I don't know, and, and we're, we're encouraging one another, we're strengthening one another, we're, we're spurring one another on, saying, yeah, this is going to be so much better. But this, we get a foretaste of it now. Pun intended, we get a foretaste of it now. But also we should invite non-believers and say, hey, the, there are seats for you at the table, in our homes and at this feast. I mean, if, if anyone comes to Jesus and and believes in him, throws herself upon his mercy, 
they will have a seat here in the marriage supper of the Lamb. I mean, guys, this is, like, this is what heaven's going to be like. So we need to rejoice and, and get ready, all right? So that's the first six verses or, or so. Um, I wanted to spend a little bit more time on that because, you know, we've been in a very judgment-heavy section of Revelation. Um, but what's fascinating about this passage, you know, the sermon's called Eat or Be Eaten. Um, it's, it's kind of the, there's two suppers at play here, right? There's the marriage supper of the Lamb, which I just described. And then if you look down in verse 17 to 21, it's called the Great Supper of God. And in the marriage supper of the Lamb, Jesus serves a feast to his bride. And in the Great Supper of God, he actually serves his enemies to the birds, and so you're like, well, how do those two go together? Well, what separates them and what distinguishes them and connects them is found in verse 11 to 16. And here, this is the great description of Jesus coming back in all of his glory. And whatever side you fall, whatever you do with Jesus will determine what side you fall on, the marriage supper or the great supper, which feast you'll be invited to. So when you think of Jesus, I want you to think, what do I think of when I think of Jesus? Do you think of a Christmas Jesus? Do you think of the cross Jesus? Do you think of the Jesus walking around with his disciples teaching and doing miracles? I mean, we get a lot of pictures of Jesus here all throughout the Bible, but here at, at this moment in Revelation, what we see is a conquering warrior. Look at this. Look at the way that he's described. Just look through verse 11 to 16. He's coming on a white horse. That means it's pure, like he's the good guy. He's the good guy. And in verse 14, we see the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, the, the, the righteousness of Christ, white and pure. They were also following him on white horses. Like these are the good guys showing up in battle, ready to conquer, ready to win, ready to end this once and for all, to slay the dragon and, and Christ bring his bride home. He's described as the one that's faithful and true, which means that he only does what God wants him to do. He only does what God wants him to do. He is perfect in every single way, even when it's avenging sin, even when it's making war on those who reject God and want him dead. Jesus is faithful and true. And he comes with eyes of fire, which means that he will expose everything that's dark or hidden. And so, you know, if you're going through the religious motions, but your heart, you're like, I don't want to do this, but I just kind of, I'm seeing this whole Christianity thing and this church thing as fire insurance, God can see right through that. He sees right through, and he will, these eyes of fire will expose what's dark and hidden and bring it all to light and lay it bare. Then he, it says that he has many diadems and, and crowns, which means he's, he's king, and he said that after he rose, at the end of Matthew, he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus is the undefeated king. I mean, he faced death and won. What can he not destroy, right? He is the undefeated, undisputed champion of everything. Everything. And then it says he has a, a name that no one knows, and you're like, okay, without getting all into the weeds of that, I mean, it's just speaking to how vast and incomprehensible and eternal he is. He was there from eternity past to eternity future. And he comes, and, and his robe is, is bloody, which, depending on how you interpret that, I mean, you could say, was well, that the, the blood of his enemies or, or the blood that he saved his people with? I mean, both could be true. I don't know. I mean, he did come the first time and was judged by sinners, and he spilled his blood for sinners as he went to the cross. And when he comes back, he's coming to judge sinners and spill their blood, as we see here. And then he's called the Word of God. The Word of God. I mean, remember John's writing Revelation, and in John chapter 1, the beginning of it, he calls Jesus the Word of God. He says, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Everything that you see, everything that exists was done through Him. Everything that's created, even our salvation, everything was done through Christ. And when He comes, He's coming with the sword in His mouth, right, by which He will strike down and judge and rule everyone by His Word. So when He exposes all of the stuff in us, and then holds it next to the Word of God, which is the only way you can make it to this feast, is by faith. 
I mean, that's, that's what he goes by. All he has to do is speak. Remember, this is the God who just spoke the earth into existence. All he has to do is speak because his word is so powerful. And he is the one that we read about a, a couple weeks ago in chapter 14. He is the one that's treading the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. It's, it's Jesus who's going to step on them. He's the one that said, no, you have personally offended me by your sin, so I'm coming and I am going to personally, I'm going to personally make this right. I'm going to personally give you what you deserve, give you what you want, a life without me, an eternity without me. And at the end it says he's the King of kings and Lord of lords. The King of kings and Lord of lords. And this is what's wild. Here, here's what another um, commentator says. He says that the Bible begins where it ends. It begins with a pristine creation over which a priest king rules for God's glory, which obviously Adam messed that up, and then we kind of got in the mess that we're in now. But then it ends with a new creation kingdom where a priest king will rule with his followers all for God's glory. When you think about the the king of kings and, and lord of lords, like these are the most, I mean, as we read on, and, and we'll get to the Second Supper in, in just a minute, but as, as you heard Parker read that, I mean, all of the most powerful kings, the most powerful rulers, the prostitute, the beast, the dragon, all of the enemies of God are there on the battlefield, and it's like that Jesus just ends them. He comes and he defeats them. He says, no, I'm so much greater than all of you. I'm so much more powerful than all of you combined. It won't even be a fight. I mean, they're conquered. And so, as you see this description of Jesus here in verse 11 to 16, I want you to think, like, who is Christ to you? Who is he to you? Because this is who he is. And this is what it will be like when he comes back. And you will either be behind him on a white horse, or you will be in front of him, dreading what's about to come your way. And whether you're behind him or in front of him, really all that it comes down to is, what do you do with him? Do you continue to put him off? Continue to reject him? Continue to just, eh, I don't know if this whole thing, or do you say, God, there is nothing I can do on my own. Save me. Only the blood of Jesus can save me. He has done what I cannot do on my own. There's no way that I could bring a perfect resume or make a perfect white dress of righteous deeds on my own because my, my life is just filled with sin, filled with imperfections. The only way that I can come is if I've been clothed by somebody else who is perfect, who is righteous, who is pure. And Jesus says, that can be yours. Because when he comes back, you're going to be with him or you're going to be against him. But he hasn't come back yet, and so we need to remember, like, yes, this is him when he's coming back, but the first time he came, he came meek and lowly. And when he comes back, he's coming in all of his majesty and all of his power. When he came the first time, he was riding on a donkey. Now he's riding on a horse into war. He came as a suffering servant, and now he's coming back as the king and the Lord. When he came the first time, he came and he suffered the wrath of God for sinners, And now he's coming to establish his kingdom for those who he's made saints. I mean, realize all of the fulfillment. And I mean, even when he came, he was rejected by so many as the Messiah. And here, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is the King of kings and Lord of lords. There will be no doubt. There will be no rejection of his identity and who he is at his return. He came the first time to seek and save the lost, and he's coming back to judge and to rule as a king, as a perfect king. I mean, he was, as we saw back in Revelation chapter 5, when John described him, like, he, he heard of the Lamb of God, but then he saw a lion, right? Jesus came as the Lamb of God who was crushed for sinners, and now he's coming back as the conquering lion to crush sinners, And so this is what we have to see here in these five verses or so, six verses or so, is that Jesus is what separates these two suppers. Jesus is what separates these two summers. 
What you do with him will, will determine which supper you will be attending. And again, kind of getting to the, the deeds that we'll get into in a minute, but the deeds, the righteous and unrighteous deeds are what, what kind of differentiate these two groups. And really, it's like, are they rooted in faith or are they rooted in self? Are they rooted in, in Christ or are they rooted in what you can do? I mean, we need to have a heart for Jesus. I mean, is, like, just ask yourself, is my heart for him? Do I love him? Do I want to love him? Do I want to, even, even if I fail, I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to be with him. I'm wanting to please him. And, and when, I, when I sin, I'm not mad because of the bad things that might happen to me or I might get caught, but I broke the heart of the person who shed his blood for me. And that needs to, I mean, and when we think about who is our heart inclined toward, that, that will tell you who you're worshiping. That will tell you who you're worshiping. And that will tell you if you're his bride or his enemy. And as one friend said when he was preaching this passage, he said, guys, if you're not on the guest list in this passage, you're on the menu. So let's look at the last couple of verses here in verse 17 to 21. This is where we see Christ will serve his enemies to the birds. He will serve his enemies to the birds. In these four or five verses or so, we see a really, really, really stern warning, but also we actually see a quite encouraging peace for believers that, that I don't want us to skip over because it seems like a lot of judgment, but it's actually really encouraging for believers. So the warning that he gives really is we can see in, in verse 17 and 18 he says, then I saw an angel standing in the sun with a loud voice. He called to the birds that flew direc directly overhead, come gather for the great supper of God to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both great, both small and great. And this is the, I mean, the warning that the birds are going to come and eat their flesh. I mean, the warning in these two verses is it's not going to be pretty for the enemies of Jesus. It's not going to be pretty at all. I mean, Jesus is the one, when we think about him treading the wine press, I described this a couple weeks ago, but if you weren't here, what they would do is they'd, they'd pick these grapes off the vine and they'd put it in this huge vat and then have these gigantic, muscular, strong, heavy men standing in this vat crushing the grapes with their feet as the juice would just squirt out. It would fill this whole vat that's how they would make blood. That was called the wine press. When Jesus says, I'm the one that's going to come and tread the wine press. And the picture that we saw back in chapter 14, I know I used miles and, and all of that to try to show you. I mean, it's like, it's like if you looked at the news after a flood hits one of the coastal cities and you see water four feet high, I mean, no one can even get around. Like that's the picture of what the blood will be like when Christ comes back. That's the picture of what it will be like. It's not going to be pretty. It's not going to be pretty at all. But there is an encouragement for those who are prepared, because these, these people are not prepared, right? In fact, the only people that are prepared, the only objects that are prepared here in this chapter are the birds who are going to come and eat their flesh. But for those who aren't prepared... It's not going to be pretty. But for those who are prepared, those who are going to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb, we see in verse 19 to 21. Let me read this, but I want, I want you to just think about the encouragement for us, beloved church, is that this is not going to be hard for Jesus. It's not going to be hard for him at all. Let me read this. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the throne and against his army. And the beast was captured, and with its false prophet, who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur, and the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. And think about all of the different characters we've been following throughout Revelation. The beast, the prostitute, the dragon, all the earth dwellers, everyone, all the great kings who have been oppressing 
first century believers, when this was written to people, I mean, they were being persecuted for their faith, tempted to compromise, tempted to give in. Like they couldn't even do business in the marketplace unless they went along with the satanic practices of the day. I mean, these are people just being pressed down from all sides, from the most powerful people in the world. These are the people that are coming for their necks. And it's like Jesus just drags them out to a battlefield. And their great leader, he just kind of picks up, throws them in the lake of fire. Like it's nothing to him. Like it's nothing. And then he takes everyone else and just says, okay, you don't want me? You don't want a life with me? Great, you're done. You're done. It's so easy for him. I mean, so quickly. I mean, you just look how fast it happened. John does not give this description of this long, verbose battle that's lasting centuries. It's like Jesus just walks up. He's like, all right, I'm ready to do this. Let's do this. You're judged. You're judged. I'm done. And I think that's an encouragement for us because as as we're living this life and we feel, maybe not to the same extent of the believers in the first century who Revelation was written to, but we feel all these pressures of temptation and we feel ostracized by people because of what we believe and and we're tempted to give in and not hold on to the end and we just want to mix a little bit of some stuff just so we can get along into our Christianity. We just want to fit in. I mean, our encouragement here is that when we press on and when we endure and when we are behind Christ, everything and anything that's ever threatened us or that could ever threaten us is done away with like that. It's gone forever. In the blink of an eye, they're judged. It's not even a fight. I mean, they show up so fast and they're immediately conquered. Immediately. And so when we think of Christ, if you're a believer, when you think of Christ, yes, it's not going to be a pretty day, but it's going to be a great day because that's our Savior, like the one who can actually save us from sin, save us from death, is that powerful to take on all the forces of the world and more and not even break a sweat. I mean, that's our Savior and so if, if you, though, are not, are not a believer, if you're here today and, and you're like, okay, Michael, I haven't really come to grips with who Jesus is and I haven't really come to him and asked for forgiveness and, and believed in him before, but I do not want to be at this great supper. I mean, even as I look back over, I, none of us should want to be there. None of us should want to be there. And you can't avoid the great supper of God by repenting of your sins and believing in him. You're, in, you're invited to the marriage supper. There's room for you at the table. So ex- accept him. Accept what he did on the cross and, and, and rose from the grave, ascended into heaven. Accept that and say, that's what I want. I can't do it on my own. Clothe yourself in his righteousness, not yours, in his righteousness. And get excited. And if you're in Christ, like, get ready for that day. We should be, I don't know when the date is, but we should be counting down, just going, I can't wait for this day to come. And every single time I can gather with believers and, and, and just get a glimpse and get a taste of what heaven's going to be like, this is the best. I mean, that's why I say Sunday is truly my favorite day. My favorite day in the world. It exhausts our kids and makes the afternoons a little sleepy. I get that. But what we get to do on Sunday mornings, when we gather together, like, this is what we're pointing toward. This is what we're fixing our eyes to. So which supper will you attend? When Jesus comes back, he's going to serve everyone. He'll either serve a feast to you if you're his bride, or he'll serve your flesh to the birds if you're his enemy. How will he serve you? Let me pray for us this morning.